All right, now we get to the Bible, God's Word, and that's what this church is all about. You know, we're a Bible church, and, and we don't want to be known as anything less than that. But anyway, uh, let me say hello again to all who are listening online, as well as our church family here today. We have a, a fuller house, and we're glad for that. And it seems that everybody's smiling, right, Dorothy? Yeah, all right. <laughs> and uh, we'll take it from there. Here we are to the book of John again, uh, to lesson number 23. I've entitled it The Miracle of the Last Enemy because Paul the Apostle said the last enemy is death. And that's what Jesus is going to deal with in John chapter 11 here. And I think this is one of the most important uh, healing ministry, shall we say, of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. And today's text brings us to see the greatest sign of all his ministry on the earth. And we'll get into the detail of it. But uh, to further help us in our studies, we're going to watch the uh, uh, multimedia presentation of the Gospel of John. Now, I want to say this because online we've been given permission to use these uh, uh, videos in, in portion form uh, for our outreach. So I certainly want to give a, a thanks to it. Now I say this, this is the Gospel of John that we are using right here. Uh, it's a video and of course it's presented uh, by the, uh, 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 let's see, the, it's the Good News Bible and uh, there is a, the, the name for it. I had it and I'm, let me see if I can find it here. I can't. But anyway, it's called The Gospel of John. It's available, for instance, in christianbook.com. You can go out to them or anyone that sells uh, videos. I'm sure they do. And you can buy it. It's a great gift for your, your children, your grandchildren, uh, or even a friend, you know, or something like that. But uh, if you watch the whole thing, it, it's... Uh, moving. This whole passage in John chapter 11, the 45 verses, I'll tell you, it uh, brought tears to my eyes as I watched it. And I think you will as well. But uh, we're going to watch it right now. But we're not going to watch the whole thing because although I've made up my message as you have in your outline there, if, if I did those 45 verses, it will be an hour and uh, 50 minutes. So if you're, you want to sit that long, I don't think you do because other things are going on. So I'm going to break up the message, but I'm going to tie it together next week so you won't miss anything. But let's watch it right now and uh, see where it takes us. A man named Lazarus, who lived in Bethany, became sick. Bethany was the town where Mary and her sister Martha lived. This Mary was the one who poured the perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. The sisters sent Jesus the message. Lord, your dear friend is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, the final result of this sickness will not be the death of Lazarus. This has happened in order to bring glory to God, and it will be the means by which the Son of God will receive glory. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he received the news that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Teacher, just a short time ago, the people there wanted to stone you. And are you planning to go back? A day has 12 hours, doesn't it? So those who walk in broad daylight do not stumble, for they see the light of this world. But if they walk during the night, they stumble, because they have no light. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. If he is asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I am glad that I was not with him, so that you will believe. Let us go to him. 
Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us all go along with the teacher, so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been buried four days before. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Judeans had come to see Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. If you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask him for. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Let's, let's pray. And ask God, of course, for that spiritual understanding, uh, the ability to uh, have a submissive heart, and ultimately for spiritual enlightenment uh, with the text. Father God, please open our minds and hearts to these things and enable us to see through the scripture how it affects and how it pertains to us in our 21st century. Lord, the Bible is never out of date, and I'm very thankful for that. And I just ask that you will enable uh, each one of us, and even all those listening online, to be able to uh, fully understand, comprehend, and apply this uh, to their lives. And may they see Jesus clearly through this, that they might make him uh, Lord of their lives. We ask our Father in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. All right, here's my outline. And as I said, I put the outline together, of course, that's the first thing I do. I read through the whole text. Uh, I try to break it up. I put it into uh, uh, different sections there to have kind of a road map that we can go through. And uh, it was really ex exciting. We're going to look at the sickness and situation of Lazarus. Uh, I call it the spat and skittish of the loyalist. That's the disciples. And the state and sorrow of the living and the sign and spectacular of renewed life. So we're going to stop somewhere between two and three, a little bit into uh, three there, and then we'll renew that in the, the weeks to come. So let's begin with verse one of John chapter 11. John says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. Now, if you remember last week, we looked at a little timeline there and we saw that when Jesus left Jerusalem because they were going to stone him there and he escaped miraculously, God delivered him because it was not time for his death. So he went back to the Jordan River Valley and that was on the east end of uh, Jerusalem there, pretty far, about a day and a half journey uh, to that area where John the Baptist had originally started his ministry. And so Jesus went back. There were a number of little small towns and villages there uh, where he settled for a short period of time. When was this time period? It was about four to six months to the time Jesus would come back to Jerusalem uh, to die on the cross. So keep that in mind. There were about four to six months till, uh, I guess it was the spring of 32 AD when he would be uh, nailed to the cross uh, there. But as we looked at this, we discover why Jesus came. And of course, we could go all the way back to the book in the beginnings, right? The book of Genesis that tells us why Jesus came to this earth. You and I know it. It all began with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God promised Adam and Eve that he would send a redeemer, a Messiah, to come and save them from the sin that they committed when they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For instance, in Genesis 3.15, I like the New Living Translation. God spoke to Satan, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring, that's Satan's offspring, and her offspring. You notice the word her, not Adam's. It was her. How could she have an offspring without Adam? God was going to create this. So he, that is the one he created, will strike your head, Satan's head, and Satan will have the ability to strike his heel, meaning that physically take Jesus' life. But at Genesis 4, 1, it goes on to say, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, the very first human being born of uh, the race of Adam, she said, this is interesting, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. But if you look at the Hebrew text, it means not a man, it says the man. And we can't be dogmatic there, but you know what it may mean? She had the faith to believe 
that Cain was the Messiah. Cain was the deliverer. Of course, he was not. And it was going to be a long time before it was going to come. But nonetheless, Jesus finally came to the earth. Now, of course, when Adam sinned, what did he bring? He brought death to his uh, human race that would come forth from him. And of course, physical death was what was happening to this man, Lazarus. Uh, now a man named Lazarus was sick. The word sick means very sick. It might mean even sickness unto death. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha tells us a little bit about him. But physical death, we all know, is a picture or divine picture of the Bible's promise of what would come forth from sin. And of course, all of us have experienced death in our families, everyone somewhere along the line. And death brings separation of loved ones and the cessation of the joys that all of us have living in this world. And of course, all the joys and all the pleasure, all the love, all the, uh, the nature of life itself comes from God. Even an unbeliever doesn't understand that, but it's, they have the blessing of God to be able to be living in God's universe here. So God warns that physical death is the preemptor of the second death, which the Bible alone speaks about. The preemptor is the finality of spiritual death. Adam died spiritually when he sinned. All of us are born spiritually dead in sin, but that's not the end of that death. There's going to come a second death, and this second death is be, uh, where God separates us in our spirit and our soul from all that God is and all that God's presence is. And that place is going to be called the lake of fire, a place of suffering for all eternity. So in this world, we're only going to experience, of course, physical death, which causes many things or is caused by many things. Many of us here are growing older and we know that we're aging. We're knowing that physically what we could do before, what we had before is kind of drifting away slowly, hopefully, not quickly at that, but nonetheless. But it can be done quickly by accidents and injuries, violence, and of course, sickness unto death, some kind of terminal illness at that. So our text introduces us to the latter, a terminal illness that befell Lazarus. Now, who are these people? Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. These were a trio of people, a small family unit, that were composed of two sisters and a apparently younger, I'm, I won't be dogmatic, but I think he was the younger uh, brother, and they were all living together. It just worked out for them in that way. But what do we know about them? Well, we're told a little bit about Mary, for instance, in Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 38 to 42. It's very small, but I'll read it for you. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She was enamored by the spiritual words that he gave. But Martha, well, she was distracted by all the preparations she had to be made. She was making all the meals, making the beds, and doing everything she could because she invited Jesus and his disciples into uh, their home. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Verse 41, and Jesus said, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So this was one of the exposures that uh, this trio, uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus had with the Lord. And because they opened their home and their heart, and all of them believe in Christ as the Messiah, their God come in human flesh. So uh, they were believers. Uh, they had a great relationship with Jesus as a result of this very thing here. But nonetheless, look at verse 2. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet uh, and later it tells us with his hair. We're going to get into that in John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. She loved Jesus spiritually. She loved him because of who he was. And she bought a very expensive jar of perfume. Maybe it was her life savings. We don't know. But it was certainly expensive. 
and she poured it on his feet. And in other texts, she poured it on his head as well. So that was a sign of great respect for that. But Jesus saw her heart and her spiritual love for God in her actions as he was her promised Messiah and Savior. And it was not forgotten on Jesus. So when Jesus received word that their brother uh, was sick unto death in a family crisis, he was prepared to go see her in uh, the town where she lived. However, uh, there was a problem there. So I'm going to give you a little uh, geography lesson here, all right? Right over here on the left side of your screen is Jerusalem, all right? And right here is the town of Bethany. It looks like a long distance, but it was only about a day's journey uh, from, uh, no, excuse me, it was a short journey. It was a mile and a half. So it was maybe a, an early morning walk uh, to Jerusalem there. But why did I say there was a problem? Because Bethany was a dangerous place to go. It was the bedroom community of Jerusalem. And remember the Jews who were in Jerusalem and Jesus said, you are not my sheep. There was a large contingency of Jews who stood with the Pharisees and they wanted nothing to do with Jesus. In fact, they took up stones to stone him with the Pharisees. So a great contingency of them lived in Bethany. So for Jesus to come back to even Bethany, uh, which was a, a suburb, shall we say, of Jerusalem there, this was not a good thing. And uh, I used that term last week, remember, uh, wokeness. Well, they were a woke community. Bethany was a woke community uh, and, uh, of the Jerusalem swamp, if we could use today's language, right? And uh, kind of like Washington, D.C. Maybe it was uh, uh, like Arlington or maybe Kensington or Bethesda. These are all surrounding communities of Washington, D.C. So to go there was really not a good idea. But look what it says in verses 3 and 4. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick, Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through them. So to whom did Jesus say this? Well, he obviously said it to his disciples and maybe the couriers who came from uh, Bethany to uh, uh, tell him uh, to come very quickly to help Lazarus in his sickness here. But they came for one purpose, and that was to restore the health of Lazarus. And it was important. By the way, this Lazarus was not the same Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Uh, that talks about the rich man and Lazarus. That was another Lazarus, so don't get them confused. He was a different man. But this brings us right away to the second point, the spat and the skittish of the loyalists, which were the disciples. How did they respond when Jesus said, well, let's go there back to uh, Judea? Now, it says Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Boy, what a puzzling text. You would have think that Jesus would have got up, packed up their tents, and ran back to Bethany before he would die so that he could heal him of his sickness. But Jesus simply did nothing. He didn't respond at all. He stayed where he was two more days. And then at the end of the two days, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, let's look at the text there, and I've underlined it. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and a sister and Lazarus. You know, this word loved is agape, or I guess we call it in the English language agape. Uh, we've done a study of the various uh, Greek words for love. This word agape is probably the most, shall we say, serious and committed word uh, for love that you could use. It's a word that means a sacrificial love. It's a word that means nothing in this world can stop you from loving something or someone. That's the kind of love that Jesus had for Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And that's the kind of love he has for you and me as well because that's the love he has for all his sheep. Anyone who has become a believer in Jesus Christ, God says nothing's going to stand between you and me 
to show you my love or to exercise my love for you. So it's important to see that very thing there. Now, remember this too. Jesus knew the heart and mind and thoughts of everyone. There isn't anyone around Jesus that he didn't know and understand from his godhood uh, who they were. He was God the Creator come in human flesh. So the Lord planned this purposely here to allow the effects of sin, which was to bring death here, its final course to Lazarus himself. But he still was going to go back to Judea, but he wanted to wait fully till Lazarus died. But with that in mind, look at verses uh, 5 and 7. It says here, he stayed where he was two more days. And the point was that he wanted to be sure that Lazarus' death was not just a, a, a momentary thing and he had died maybe a few moments ago or, or what. He wanted to make sure that real death had taken its course. So rather than rushing to Lazarus' aside, the Lord was going to do even better. His goal was to bring Lazarus back from the dead. This was something new that uh, they had never really experienced. Now, the point is, when these uh, couriers came, Jesus could have answered and said, let's go, I'm going with them right now. We're going to rush back to Bethany, which would have been an answer to the prayer of Mary and Martha. But Jesus didn't answer their prayer, did he? Not at all. And you know, the point is, I see in this text here, that God often doesn't answer our cries for immediate help. You're going to call out to God for something you want or need, and it's not going to come. It's going to seem like God isn't listening to you or God isn't answering, but God hears your prayers. There's nothing that uh, God's children pray that God will not hear instantly and he will respond in his perfect timing here. And why did he delay? Because he had better plans than what Mary and Martha thought Lazarus needed. And you know, when you pray or I pray and Ursula and I will pray, God sometimes doesn't answer immediately because he has greater plans in what we have asked him for in our life and our relationships here. So think about that very thing. Now, verse 8. This is the... Uh, Loyalist, the uh, disciples. But rabbi, teacher, they said, a short while ago, don't you remember? The Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Man, they were just upset over this thing because if he left, they'd have to go with him. And if he was going back to be stoned, what was going to happen to them? Well, they would all be stoned to death, you know? So they thought through on this thing here. So the disciples became quite skittish about this. And you know, you and I, when we look at the disciples, we sometimes think, oh, they're super saints. They're way above you and me. We, we can never be like them. Really, they're no different from you. And they were no different from you or me. But they often failed their Lord, and he was constantly seeking one thing for them, to increase their faith. And you know, that's the one thing God wants to do for you. And for me, I don't care if you're a believer for one month or you're a believer for 72 years. God wants to still increase your faith wherever it is because there's no limit to what your faith should be. In fact, let's use the term, it can be an infinite faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be satisfied that, well, I've reached this point now. I'm satisfied with my faith. Really? Well, God isn't satisfied with your faith, and he's going to do things in your life to make sure that it can start moving up even further here. But nevertheless, fear gripped the disciples here, and they thought, oh, this was a foolhardy, reckless decision. Why did they think that? Well, as the devil once said to uh, a saint in the past there, skin for skin, and that's what they were thinking. Well, when it came down to their own skins, they were going to watch for that there. And uh, they were willing to do the Lord's work, but not when it costs so much money here. But, you know, think about that. How about you? Do you fear injuries or, shall we say, loss of maybe friendships or family members who are unsaved or neighbors by openly showing and sharing your faith? Sometimes we're fearful, like the disciples, of doing something that's going to bring pain into to their lives. 
You know, in all the years of ministry, I found out that every Christian in the fellowships we had sometime in their life were fearful, and they showed it. Let me give you an example. Sometimes on a Sunday morning service, or maybe it was a Sunday evening, most of our Bible-believing churches years ago had a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening and a Wednesday, Wednesday service. So uh, they were very faithful people, never missed any of the services. But sometimes people wouldn't be there for one of the services. And later on, when you asked them uh, when they came back, hi, we missed you. And they said, oh, we had a family engagement. Our unsafe family members wanted a, a lunch and barbecue on the weekend, and so we went with them. But you know, when you do things like that, uh, the unsafe family members look at you and they say, well, I guess your faith really doesn't mean that much because you might have said to us, well, no, I can't come because God told me to worship on Sunday. I'll come later on after church service, but things like that. But I'm just using that as an example. So other times it could be we don't speak up for the Lord or we don't let people know we're a Christian because we're afraid of some kind of persecution or just fear of being ostracized by the boss or uh, our friends or family. And so we put Christ and his work further back on the list of things to do. So who in your circle of friends or even family members has experienced your lack of commitment to Christ? Maybe that's what the text is showing us right now through the disciples here. Well, anyway, their fears took over for them, and they didn't know what to do. So Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will stumble, for they see this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. You know, when I first read this text, my first thought was, what's that doing there? It's kind of like something that didn't belong there, right? But it did belong there because I started to think about this. Jesus now stops the disciples murmuring and their dislike of Jesus' plans, and he gives them an analogy. That's what this is. This is just an analogy here. The mention of the 12 hours to them was to symbolize something. The duration of the Lord's ministry was short. Night was coming for the Lord when no man could work and how important it really was. So the Lord reminded them not only did he have a limited time, but every disciple for the Lord has a limited time. And you and I have limited time as well to accomplish the Father's will. So think about that very thing. And uh, I think of the uh, missionary, I think, believe his name was C.T. Studd. He once said, only one life will soon be passed but only what's done for Christ will last. You know, that became a very well-known saying that everyone has kind of memorized. Maybe you should memorize that. I'll say it again. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's what this passage means. And it's so important there. So how about you? Do you use your allotted time for the Lord? Or do you fill it with all kinds of things that won't count for eternity? This is not to say the things we do in our everyday life, whether it be digging for uh, planting new shrubs or anything. Ursula and I were in the garden this weekend here, uh, putting uh, down some of the uh, uh, cover uh, for the ground and uh, like that. Nothing wrong with doing those things, but we just have to maybe make sure that we're not forgetting the things of the Lord that's there. So we all need to consider this as well. We have only so much daylight to work because the night is coming. Now, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, he said, look, they were all fussing over this. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He, you know, he, he wanted to be kind to the disciples so that it, it didn't like slap them in the face so very quickly. But I'm going there to wake him up. And so his disciples immediately replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he's going to get better so we don't have to go. That's perfect, right? He's going to get better. He's sleeping. And that's not what he meant. So talk about being skittish. The disciples discussed it among themselves. No, they didn't want to go back to the Judean territory of Bethany at all. And they feared for their lives. It's better to leave Lazarus to die. Really, that's actually what they were saying. But you know what? Jesus knew that he had not fallen asleep in this sense here, physically. He had fallen asleep in death. 
And he's going to say that in just a minute here. So Jesus supernaturally knew that Lazarus had already died. And when did this happen? When the couriers came from Bethany to tell him that Lazarus needed him to come quickly because he was on his deathbed, by the time they left, Lazarus had fallen into death. He was already dead. So think about now. It took about a full day's journey to get to the Jordan River. So Lazarus was dead for a whole day already. Now, we're going to count days in a moment here. But nonetheless. But I want to stop here because when I saw this term fallen asleep, I thought, you know, there's a whole group of uh, people who call themselves Christians, and I believe Many of them are probably, but they have a lot of uh, goofy theology. What is this goofy theology? It's called Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we have them in our area here, and there's very fine, good people who are part of that, but they teach false theology. They teach this concept of uh, this uh, sleep. Think about this. Uh, the, the idea that when you die, your body uh, goes to sleep in the grave and you become unconscious until God wants to revive you. You know, years ago in my first ministry, uh, we were in a place called Benton Harbor, Michigan. Our church was called Calvary Bible Church. It was a nice church. Anyway, my oldest son went to the Sunday school and he came uh, home one Sunday and I always asked him, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And he said, Dad, I learned that when I die, we become unconscious in sleep. And I thought, what? What? Where did you get that from the Sunday school teacher? Well, I, I went to the Sunday school teacher and I found out that she had gotten literature from Andrews University. This was a big Seventh-day Adventist university around us. And she thought it was good and brought it into the class and just started teaching it here. So I said to her, you know, I said to John, I said, John, there's no such thing as soul sleep. Just understand that. But they were teaching that. But let me, let me give it to you, because before we move on, you'll get to know the theology. The Seventh-day Adventist uh, General Conference writes this, and I'm going to quote them specifically. Death is not complete annihilation. It is only a state of temporary unconsciousness while the person awaits the resurrection. The Bible repeatedly calls this intermediate state asleep. The soul has no conscious existence apart from the body. And it goes on to say, no scripture indicates that at death the soul survives a conscious entity. Now, what they just said contradicted themselves. First of all, they, in the end there, they say that the soul does not survive uh, consciousness when it dies. But yet at the same time, they say it's a temporary unconsciousness. How could you have survival if it does, you don't exist? You know, it's a, a completely incongruous statement there. So in making their case, they lean heavily upon the book of Ecclesiastes that says the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, Ecclesiastes 9.53. But that text is not talking about the spirit of man. It's talking about the body of man. When the body goes in the ground, it's dead. There's no question. There, it, it has no consciousness whatsoever. But you are not a body. You're also a soul and a spirit. And the soul and the spirit, of course, goes on. And 2 Corinthians 5.8 says this. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I like the King James says, we'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So don't believe any of the soul sleep stuff. And Jesus was not alluding to that in any way. We are not in the grave sleeping unconscious. So keep that in mind. Now back to Jesus and his disciples, all right? Verse uh, 15. Jesus had been speaking of his death. That's what he meant by his sleep. By his disciples thought he meant natural sleep, so they told him plainly, Lazarus is dead. He said, and for your sakes, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Now, the object of the Lord's work and ministry for the disciples what, what, was what? The very thing we talked about before, that they would grow in their faith, that you might grow in your faith as you study the same words that John the Apostle is giving us by the power of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. So the object of God's Word is the same, growing and growing 
and growing, and I hope you are growing in your faith through a knowledge of the Word of God and through its application in your heart. So the question before all of us, and I had to think about it myself, is my faith stronger? Is my faith deeper? Is my faith more alive today than it was in the past, say, even a year ago? Ask yourself that question. If it isn't, you haven't been faithful to what God wants for you to get out of the Word of God. And it's important. So the point, through the course of life with its disappointments, and they're going to be there, and our trials and our tragedies, God still wants you to grow in your faith. So whatever you're going through, whatever it's going to bring, and some of us will face some very serious trials and sufferings in the days ahead. God is there to be with you. That's the important thing. So that you can grow and be with him for all eternity. And that's exactly what he said. Notice that. He told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad. Isn't that terrible for him to say, I'm glad that Lazarus is dead here? Now, he died even before the messengers finally got to Jesus. And it took, perhaps, as I said, a good day's journey at best here. So Lazarus was dead probably for about one day. And then what did Jesus do? We had our text before. He waited two more days. So one day dead, two day dead, three day dead, right? So already Lazarus is dead for three days. Why did he do that? Because the Lord wanted everyone to know what true death was. Now, why do I say true death? And this is why. Don't be fooled. Death doesn't always really mean dead. Does that kind of confuse you? Let me give you the answer to that. You see, there's two kinds of death today. There is clinical death and there's biological death. And there is a difference. Medically, clinically death is simply the cessation of blood circulation in your body and breathing. Now, that happens to people, and you and I would immediately think they're dead. Even in the medical uh, scene, it is a form of death. Now, today, we've had a lot of stories about people who have died and gone to heaven from little boys and others. You, you've heard all the stories, right? And they've come back from the dead. Well, yes, they have. They've come back from clinical death. And I don't know how long that can be, and I, maybe we haven't even reached the depth of what that can be. It could be minutes, uh, it might be 20 minutes, it might be a half an hour, it might be a few minutes, I don't know. But my point is, that's clinical death, and that's not really death. And the reason I say that is, biological death is not the same. What causes clinical death? Let me give you some examples. Asphyxiation, uh, drowning injuries, poisoning, uh, anaphylaxis. But all these things can be reversed. Think about that. But if not treated quickly, they will end in biological death. And there's no coming back from biological death. I don't care who it is. I don't care who says they can do that. They cannot do that very thing. So keep that in mind. Now, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he said, Lazarus is biologically dead. That's right. Three days now, or at least the first day when he said that, but after the second uh, two days, three days. So his body lay now for, by the time Jesus got to Bethany from the journey, four days had elapsed. Now, think about this. I really want you to think about this. They quickly put bodies in the tomb, and they knew why, because these bodies started to completely decompose very quickly. How about the hot temperature in the tomb without embalming? What did it do? It made a rotting, terribly stinking, fully decomposing, grotesque body in that tomb. And there's no doubt if they went in and re-examined him, his death would have been personified, all right? But now, 
the 11 disciples, not the 12, mind you, because the 12th disciple was Judas, and Judas was a false believer, as we later find out. But the 11 had already fully believed in Jesus as Messiah and God. You remember very well what John said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they bowed their knees before Jesus. They knew who he was, and they believed fully in him. Now that Lazarus was dead, we know that the Lord... Would he be able to resurrect him? Absolutely, because he was God. He was the creator come in human flesh. And his own death was uh, looming in the background as well. So we find out here, Jesus' statement, he was glad that Lazarus had died. Why would he say that? Well, you think about it. When Lazarus died, and remember Lazarus was a believer, where did Lazarus go? He went to the same place the other Lazarus went to. And that was, of course, uh, the uh, grave. And it was called paradise. Paradise was that part of uh, death whereby all the believers would gather together. Remember, they couldn't go to heaven because Christ hadn't died yet. So God had to have a holding place for all the saints from Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the believers down through the centuries, including Lazarus, where they could go, that it would be a form of heaven. It would be just like heaven. It would be a place of joy and, and just excitement. So Lazarus went there. Think about that. Lazarus with, was with Abraham in his bosom, as they said. And he was there rejoicing with all the Old Testament believers we've just spoken about here. And so Jesus was glad he was there, as well he was glad as the disciples uh, uh, could find out that he was dead here. But now when Lazarus went dead, do you think he wanted to come back? <laughs> no, nobody who died and is a believer would ever want to come back. If you have a loved one who's a believer and died, they love you, but they don't want to ever come back here. They want you to come and be with them uh, as well as that. So Jesus was glad for his disciples as well. And now uh, he was glad because Lazarus was really enjoying his life. But let's take a look and see what happened. But Jesus said, let us go to him. Who? Lazarus. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said the rest of the, with the rest of the disciples, he was the spokesman now for all the others. They had discussed this whole thing. He said, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, just think about this very thing here. Thomas and the other disciples uh, for a while were aghast about going back. Jesus wanted to return to Judea, as I said a moment ago, which was the nickname for the Jerusalem area. And they knew what might happen to him if he did. Was Jesus crazy? Were they in a suicide cult? You know, there are a lot of suicide cults, but this was not one of them because this was not the time for Jesus to die, nor did the Father in heaven want Jesus to die at this time. But Jesus was this, uh, excuse me, Thomas was the spokesman. Now notice what he's called, Didymus. Didymus means twin. It means that he was a twin of either a girl or a boy. We don't know, so we don't take it any further. The disciples knew who his twin was, but uh, they, he or she was not part of the discipleship, but Thomas was, and he was the spokesman for all the others. But nonetheless, they thought Jesus was going to die, and guess what? They were committed now, they had to think it over, of course, but they were willing to die. And that brings you and me to think about it, too. If you and I were ever in a position, and Ursula and I go over this every once in a while, and I say, what would happen if in the church service here, we were in a communist country, and we're holding a service, and the door broke open with people with guns came in and said they were going to kill everyone who was a professed Christian. And all the professed Christians were to get up out of their seats and stand in the front with the pastor. Would you do that? Now, honestly, you're not in that position. So I know you don't have to think about it. But nonetheless, sometimes Ursula and I would think about these things and how would we respond. And at first, we would be like the disciples, wouldn't we? We don't want to die skin for skin. But then we'd think about it. And if we're really a believer, we would go forward. But now, what would make you go forward? Let me tell you. It would be the power of the Spirit of God in you. 
but you don't need that power right now. It's something God will give to every believer who will face death for whatever reason. And so Thomas and other disciples here, God the Spirit gave them the power to say yes. Let's go there, and if we may die with him, we're going to die with him. We have given our all, and we're going to walk with him. Is that your commitment to Jesus Christ? It ought to be. And if it isn't, make it right now, and God will give you the strength for whatever you have to face in your life before this. So they were loyal, and they indeed were the loyalists here. And they would be until God called them home. All right, now we move to verses 17 to 21. Jesus arrives in Bethany. Takes another day. And so, uh, again, count the days. Now Lazarus is dead and he's in a tomb for four days. Boy, there's a lot of rotting going on there, right? All right, think about that. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. There's that letting you know how close it is. And many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Now, this is a little strange text. Uh, where was Jesus? He really wasn't in the confines of Bethany. He had come to the outskirts of Bethany. So he was a little cautious. Let's remember that. And uh, Mary and Martha had heard about it. And so Martha runs out there to meet him. And I guess they were setting up their tents. They did have tents, you know. That's how they stayed. And remember that all the disciples, there were many women who came with them too, right? And they were saved and, and they were helpers and things. So there was a whole entourage that came with Jesus. And they, they set up their tent outside of the confines of Bethany. And Martha comes out to meet Jesus there. And uh, Mary stayed home. Now, we don't know why Mary stayed. Lazarus wasn't there anymore. He was in the tomb, right? So she was really all alone unless she was just with friends. I think she was miffed. Jesus didn't come, and Lazarus died. He could have been there, but he didn't come. So maybe she was a little upset over that. But Martha, oh, she wanted to meet the Lord. And verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, she was full of tears. My brother would not have died. Can you feel her tears and her, and her suffering and the whole thing? She didn't understand Jesus. He was a healer. Why didn't he come and heal the one he loved? Remember the word loved? This was a sacrificial love that would pay any price for the one he loved. But Jesus didn't come. However, let's remember where Lazarus was, his body at least. He had already passed away, and it was biological death to the uh, seriousness of it here. Already his body was what? Decomposing. His organs and brain cells and body tissues. And think of it, even his extremities, maybe even the tips of fingers and things would be already breaking off. Uh, and the smell of terrible death had permeated his body. I don't know if you've ever smelled death human death. When I, uh, uh, before I was saved, uh, I, I was in the telephone company and uh, I had a job. I was a, a cable splicer and my job was to put a brand new cable in a, a hospital in New York City and I had to go into the cytology ward where the cable went. The cytology ward is where they took all the organs apart and examined them and everything. So the whole place was filled with the smell of death. I mean, it was so bad. I had to get a uh, clothespin to work and put it on my nose. I couldn't take the smell of death. It was a horrible smell. So you can imagine how Lazarus must have smelled. And, and uh, the sisters are going to tell you about that tomorrow, uh, next week about that. But anyway, however, Martha heard Jesus was arriving and he seemed to have settled down in the outskirts there. And she ran to meet him crying all the way. And on that, she began to say, oh, if you had been here, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I'm going to stop here because this is really an important area and it kind of breaks it up a bit. And I'm going to take up here so you're not going to miss anything next week. So I just hope you are watching online that you're going to watch again uh, next week for this very thing. But let's put it into some uh, summary and, and practice here, okay? I'm going to give you about four things. First of all, life back then 
hey, was no different from today. People lived, people died, people suffered disease and accidents and tragedy and death and time took all the family members and sometimes quite quickly. And thus, whether it's the first century or the 21st century, we all must go through these things. And number two, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they were a close family, and they were friends of Jesus, really close. But you know what? Being in such relationship didn't give them privileges to avoid the heartaches of this fallen world and life. And you and I have learned that as we've grown old, haven't you? You're a believer in Christ, but you're still going to experience the things that go on in this life, whether it happens to the unbeliever or whether it happens to the believer. And there's going to be heartaches that befall us in this world. And some of you here are going through it physically right now. And yet you know, or at least you believe, that Jesus knows all about it. And he's going to work on your behalf. But nonetheless, death comes to us all, doesn't it? But you know what? When I think about death, death is something that should be unacceptable. We should live forever. Don't you feel that way? I feel even when I was a young man, I would live forever. Now that I'm an older man, I don't think I'm going to live forever. I know that physically in my own body here. But death is not something normal. It's not something natural, nor did God ever plan it to be there. But death is a reminder, isn't it, that something is wrong in this world in which we live. And when Jesus got to the tomb, do you know what it says about him? And we'll get in it next week. Jesus wept. You know, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Think about that. Why did he weep? Oh, of course he wept that Jesus, uh, that Lazarus had died and, and Mary and Martha had suffered the pain of loss. But that's not why he really wept. He wept in pain because he looked at the world in here and all the things that had brought death because of Adam's sin and all the death that would go on for another 20 centuries after Jesus left this earth. He knew the pain and suffering that would go on. And as such, that's why I said earlier, I named this message that here indeed, this is the overcoming, the miracle that would overcome the last enemy. Death is the last enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26. And the Lord conquered death. You and I know that for us here. So we can rejoice in the fact that death is conquered. Yes, we're going to experience this world and the sufferings of it, but it's only for a short time compared to what eternity is going to be for you and me, where the joy and happiness we're going to have for all eternity. But you know, to help us understand that, God has already given us life eternal. That's right. You and I are never going to stop living in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because even Paul said, I gave you that verse before, we're going to be absent from the body, but present with the Lord. You're not even going to lose one moment of consciousness when you move from this body into the eternity with Jesus Christ. And what a joy it's going to be. But you know, the world sees it this way. The world says, seeing is believing. We're not going to believe unless we can see something. But once you've become a Christian and you've received faith from the Lord Jesus Christ, that's changed into now believing without seeing. Isn't that right? You and I don't need to see. Now, number three, God hears our prayers. We know that. But some friends traveling to meet Jesus and tell him of the dire family health crisis and situation, but Jesus didn't answer their request, did he, as desired? And you and I are going to see those things in our life too. You're going to pray desperately for something. And you've probably already in your life maybe prayed desperately and the answer didn't come the way you thought. But God hears your prayers. God heard Mary and Martha's prayer. And he was going to answer it even better than before. And number four, Martha, although grief-stricken when she met and talked with Jesus, I don't think she had any animosity in her. While she spoke of her disappointment, she mentioned if you had only been here, he wouldn't have died. But guess what? She still accepted him as her God. And she still accepted that his ways were a higher ways than her ways. And even though she didn't understand it, she trusted in him. And you know, that's what we have to end this message on. You need to trust Jesus no matter what you're going through. And don't give up that trust. And make sure that you even tell the Lord that, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. 
and God will be there for us all. So we believe without a doubt that God hears our prayers. So in summation, here's number five. Are you willing to trust Jesus when all things around your life seem to be going to ruin? I had to put the word ruin because I couldn't put the other word in there. And it's exactly what it is, isn't it? You look at this world around us and that's where it's going. If something isn't going to change, the end of the United States of America is coming. It, it, it has to. And I think God may step in. I pray that God will step in. But we must trust the Lord. But that happens sometimes in our own lives and things around us as well. But we can trust him. And you know why Paul said it so wonderfully in Romans 8, 28 and 38 and 39. And we know, isn't that a beautiful word? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Nothing in this world is going to happen that is not working for your good, for your family's good, for this church's good, for our personal good. And Paul went on to say for this purpose, for I'm convinced, he said, means beyond a shadow. Out of a doubt, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers anywhere at all, nor neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Is there anything left out? No. He said, we'll be able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I left out the last part of what Martha said because it's really important. She said, Jesus, if you had only been there, Lazarus wouldn't have died. But she went on to say, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Is that your faith? That must be your faith when everything else seems to be falling away. Trust God in his word. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the word of God today. And I wish I could have finished the whole section, but I have so many more things to say next week. And I just pray we'll be able to continue it. But Lord, if there's anyone listening today online and they have never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, help them to see Martha, help them to see Mary, and help them to see Lazarus too. He was a believer. Help them to see the disciples. Help them to see us here at a house for his name. And help them to see the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to them through the word of God today. To put their faith and trust in Jesus as their only Savior. As the one who died on the cross for their sins. And paid the price for all sin that will bring them the freedom of eternal life as a gift that God will give them. When they surrender their will to Jesus as Lord God and Savior. Now, Lord, we've done that. Some of us, maybe many decades ago, it doesn't really matter when, but if we were a young person or an older person, if our faith and trust is in Jesus, he will go with us through every day of our lives and we can have that faith and assurance. So may that blessing be real for all who are listening today and hearing this message. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.